Actress Belinda Bromelow is preparing to transform herself into a young American peace activist. The big black bug bled black blood. Blood. <gasps> She's starring in My Name is Rachel Corrie, a controversial play about a woman who was killed in Gaza five years ago. Tonight, Dateline has invited two special guests to watch the play and debate it afterwards. Gren Carlil works for the Australia-Israel Jewish Affairs Council, a Zionist lobby group. The play is very controversial. It's, uh, it's, I've read that it's very one-sided and, uh, and it lacks a lot of context regarding the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. So, uh, so I want to see if it's, uh, if it is as controversial as it's made out to be. Also here is Anthony Lowenstein, a Jewish writer who often criticizes Israel. Obviously I didn't know her before she died, tragically, but um, I'd read that she was um, a passionate young woman, probably a bit naive, who uh, went to Gaza to try and essentially protect the Palestinians from occupation. Obviously, just like any story, it's biased, and particularly with this, it's one person's perspective, but it is a young person's perspective who is keen and passionate and who really threw herself into life. My name is Rachel Corey. I am 12 years old. I was born on April 10th, 1979 in Olympia, Washington. When I was five, I discovered boys, which made life a little more difficult, just a little and a lot more interesting. Rachel was determined to be a writer and the play is made up of extracts from her letters and journals. When I graduated year five, we had a, uh, a list of questions for our school yearbook. And one of them was, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, everybody wrote something like doctor or astronaut or Spider-Man. And then you turn the page and there was my five paragraph manifesto on the millions of things I wanted to be, from wandering poet to first woman president. I'm here for other children. I'm here because I care. I'm here this is Rachel Corey in fifth grade, already displaying the keen social conscience that led her to the Gaza to Strip years later. Are preventable. We have got to understand that people in third world countries think and care and smile and cry just like us. As she got older, Rachel threw herself into community and environmental activism here in Olympia, not far from Seattle. But after the September 11 attacks, she became interested in American foreign policy, and two years later, she traveled to Israel. January 25th, 2003. Very little problem at the airport. My uh, tight jeans and cropped bunny hair sweater seemed to have made all the difference. And of course, the use Rachel of Rachel was one of many badges. international volunteers who came to protest against the Israeli army's actions in the West Bank hands. and Gaza Strip. I took a shared taxi she worked with the International Jerusalem. Solidarity Movement, a Palestinian-led group committed to non-violent resistance. The scariest thing for non-Jewish Americans in talking about Palestinian self-determination is the fear of being or sounding anti-Semitic. I'm really new to talking about Israel-Palestine, so I don't always know the political implications of my words. But Rachel did know her work was dangerous. Like other volunteers, she was on the front line of the conflict in the Gaza Strip. She placed herself in front of bulldozers and tanks that were demolishing homes in order to create a so-called buffer zone. The Israeli army says the area was riddled with tunnels used to smuggle weapons. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls. I think even the smallest of children here understand that life isn't like this everywhere. They love to get me to practice my limited Arabic. And so today, I tried to learn to say, Bush is a tool. <laughs> but
but I don't think it translated quite right. I think Rachel Curry's motivations were admirable. However, I think what would have been more responsible for her to do is actually find out a little bit about the conflict and the war zone that she was throwing herself into. That was a very simplistic view. She blamed Israel entirely. She in no way, shape or form uh, uh, laid any blame at the, the door of the Palestinians. This view was naive. Even the most extremely uh, pro-Palestinian person would suggest that the Palestinians have done some wrong, which Rachel Corrie didn't do. I think uh, where I differ with Bren, of course, is the fact that when she went to Israel and she went to Gaza, she, her relief very much was to support the underdog, which obviously she'd been through all her life. And the victim in this conflict, as she talks about consistently, the Palestinians, Israel is occupying Palestinian land. That is an undisputed fact. If any one of us had our lives and welfare completely strangled and lived with children in a shrinking place where we knew that soldiers and bulldozers and tanks could come for us at any moment with no means of economic survival and our houses demolished. Do you not think in a similar situation that most of us would defend ourselves as best we could. It started out, we thought it, uh, when they first contacted us, well, Craig and I weren't. Rachel's there, parents, so Craig and Cindy, say their daughter's letters opened their eyes to another side of the conflict. Uh, and they believe the play now does this for audiences around the world. Here in the United States, we don't hear much about what happens to Palestinians. We hear a lot about happen what happens to Israelis, and a lot of that's horrible. Cindy and I have friends who have lost children who died in bus bombing. So we know something about that part of the story, but we learn from Rachel about the Palestinians and who've lost children to being shot. What we're paying for here is truly evil. Maybe the general growing class imbalance in the world. And this is an extract from one of the last letters her. Rachel wrote in to Columbia, her parents. Anyway, I'm rambling. I just want to tell my mom that I'm really scared. And I'm questioning my fundamental belief in the goodness of human nature. This has to stop. I think it'd be a good idea for all of us to drop what we're doing and devote our lives to making this stop. I don't think that's an extremist thing to do anymore. And I still want to dance around a Pat Benatar and have boyfriends and make comics for my co-workers, but I also want this to stop. A few days after writing those words, Rachel Corey was killed. The International Solidarity Movement says this photo shows her trying to stop an army bulldozer from demolishing a Palestinian home. And that this photo was taken after she was crushed. The first word that we got was uh, on television, seeing uh, the words run, run across the, the bottom of the screen. It said, Olympia woman killed in the Gaza Strip. Um, and I'm not proud of the fact that I wondered if there could be some other person besides Rachel. Uh, but, but I think that's a very human reaction when you know that someone you love so deeply is um, probably hurt very, very badly or, or lost. I love you guys. Sorry about the diatribe. <laughs> Who do you hold responsible for her death? I think the International Solidarity Movement. This is an organization which is a Palestinian organization that takes naive Westerners and puts them as human shields in war zones. It's actually a war crime. According to the Fourth Geneva Convention, which Rachel Corey quotes so often during this play, it is a war crime to create and deploy human shields. But Rachel Corey was a human shield. So you're saying Rachel Corey was being used by the ISN? Rachel Corey died when she was protecting a weapon smuggling tunnel. Yes, I'd suggest that she was manipulated by the International Solidarity Movement. No. Well, that's obviously a view I don't share. There were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Palestinians who essentially were left homeless over years because Israel claimed, without much evidence I might add, that these houses were supporting terrorists, which is simply untrue. 
The information about what happened to Rachel on that final day is contested. There's no doubt about that. The International Solidarity Movement claims that the, the bulldozer driver saw Rachel and drove over her. There are conflicting versions. I wasn't there. I can simply base it on what I've read in a variety, variety of sources. I suspect what happened is that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time in the actual bulldozer the in Israel wrong place itself. At the wrong time. The, she purposely put herself absolutely. in the path of the bulldozer. And that is not so. being in the wrong place at Ab the wrong no, absolutely, time. Absolutely that, is. Is a, a, that is a choice that she made. And I, I can say that I have read about it, but I've also seen it. I have seen the video footage leading up to her death. As have she, I. she was in a ditch in front of a bulldozer, crouching down. She chose to be there. That's not wrong place at the wrong time. So therefore she deserved to die? Uh, I, not at all. And to, to put such words in my mouth is, is disgraceful. The, woman the passions the aroused by Rachel's life and death hands. have had serious consequences for the play. Into Jerusalem. In 2006, a New York theater indefinitely postponed its production out of concern for the sensitivities of Jewish groups. Many denounced the decision as censorship yeah, I think people are very afraid um, to take on this particular topic because, um, as Rachel says, often when you try to take on the Israel-Palestine conflict, there's that fear of being labelled, you know, anti-Semitic, which is just ridiculous. What happened in New York was that when there was talk about bringing it to the states, there was serious pressure on the powers that be there from elements of the, the Israel powers lobby. That be. Yeah, from the Israel lobby. This is what this, this is about. This is the way the Zionist lobby works. They don't like something. They put pressure on organisations or individuals. This is the way it works. And in New York, sadly, temporarily, they were successful. Eventually, they were not. In the UK, in most places around the world, it was sold, selling out audiences, as it has in Australia as well. The point is, sadly an organisation that Bren is a member of in Australia does not believe in the concept of open and free debate. That sounds like absolute rot. Uh, the organisation that I work for happens to be the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council. We do not try and shut down debate. We want open and free speech. From uh, your perspective only. What rot? Uh, opinion pieces in newspapers around Australia have uh, opinion pieces for, for both narratives. This is democracy. This is pluralism. This is freedom of speech. Ajak is trying to do that. Well, I'm still waiting to see a, um, an Israel lobbyist ever complain about a performance that was very, very pro-Israel. If that happens, I'd like to be told about it. Well, as someone from the quote-unquote Israel lobby, I'd like to say I'm no theatre critic. <laughs> and, uh, and all I can talk about is the, the context of plays as opposed to the plays themselves. We're all born, and someday we'll all die. Perhaps like the play's ideological critics are missing the point. I will what touches audiences is a I young woman's disarming attempts to make a difference. I can't cool boiling waters in Russia. I can't be Picasso. I can't be Jesus. I can't save the planet single-handedly. I can wash dishes. I don't believe, you know, that every young person needs to go to Gaza or to do this kind of work. But I, I think the question of how can I make a difference in the world is something that it's good that people think about when they see um, this play, when they hear this story.